Hi YouTube, welcome back to our channel. It has been a long minute, I do apologise. So tonight's case is the Peter Manuel case. So as always, we'll do the spirit box, I will give you my predictions, but we will stick to the facts of the case. So get the kettle on, sit back, relax. Remember, like, comment and subscribe because you will get a wee notification when we go live or if I put any videos up. Um, again, get the kettle on, let's do this. Peter Thomas Anthony Manuel was born on the 13th of March 1927. Now he was born to Scottish parents but he was born in New York City. He lived alongside there with his father and his mother. They then moved to Detroit, Michigan and eventually they emigrated back to Scotland in 1932 where they then went to Birkenshaw, Lanarkshire. Now it was said that Peter Manuel was bullied as a child and by the age of 10 he was very well known to the police. By the age of 16 he had a string of sexual assaults to his name and charges where he ended up serving 9 years in Peterhead prison. Now the reason I'm bringing this in is because this would then rule Peter Manuel out as being Bible John and a lot of people get the cases mixed up where they think that there's a chance that Peter Manuel is Bible John so just to clear that up, he was actually in the jail for 9 years at that point. Now, reading between the lines with Peter Manuel, it does come across that he was very much a recluse. He liked to drink on his own. He would go into different bars, maybe speak with people, but then leave. But no one knew much about him as such, other than the gossip that was already said about him. But in 1955, he actually had a rape charge and he was up in court in Airdrie Sheriff Court and he actually represented himself says a lot about someone, doesn't it? There's quite a bit of narcissism in there. But he was actually convicted of seven murders. Now, there was eight, but one was thrown out. This all happened in 1958, and we're going to go through all the victims and exactly what happened, and I will give you my take as we go. Peter Manuel's first victim was a young girl at 17 named Anne Neelands. Now, Anne Neelands lived in the Calderwood estate in East Bride, and she'd went dancing on the 2nd of January with her friends and hadn't returned home but her parents assumed that she had been staying with friends or possibly studying with them and they didn't actually report her missing until the 4th of January. A man George Gribbon was walking at the East Kilbride golf course on the 4th of January 1956 and he came across Anne's body. Now there was men who were from the gas board he ran to and told them he had discovered this body. They didn't really take him seriously, so he ended up going to Calder Glen Farum where he raised the alarm to the police. When the police arrived, now this is just a trigger warning, they did say that her head had been smashed in. Um, what had actually happened was she had tried to get away, so there was evidence that there was running marks in the mud of 400 yards, but because it was so dark, she had actually went into bad wire. Now they'd found parts of her underwear, had been ripped off and things but there were no signs of sexual assault and I just find that so strange considering Anne was actually going out on a date that night and it, she basically got stood up and was heading back home and this happened. Now obviously the man that Anne was meant to meet was also under suspicion but again there was an alibi, that man was very genuine, I actually think he was heartbroken that what had actually happened in the end, I think there'd been some sort of miscommunication or he'd well, again, it's not like the way it is now. We could just pick up the phone and say we're running late. So Anne didn't have enough. She only had four pence in her purse, so she didn't have enough to get into the dancing, and that's why she had to head home, and obviously to the fate at that point of Peter Manuel. The police did interview the gas board men because obviously they were working close to the body, and one of the gas board men had said that one of their workers had come in with scratches on his face. His name was Peter Manuel. The police did interview Peter Manuel, but his father gave him an alibi, so straight away he was out before he was even in. But the fact that he had scratches on his face and that the fact that they did interview him just shows you that plain sight. And you usually find that's the case, but you also find the murderer always comes back to the location, whether it be straight away or afterwards, just to see if anything's changed. Now, Peter Manuel did taunt the police and he left a lot of Anne's belongings all over the place, but it was thought, and I'm just going to read this out properly so that I don't get anything wrong with it, that he exited the crime scene through Morris Hall Road north to either the Black Braes Road or along to the Old Peddler's Way. He then went to the Stony Meadow Road and the General Bridge to Blantyre and beyond. Now, later, once he got caught, he did offer to take police to the crime scene for to show where the weapon was. 
Now we do know that Peter Manuel was not caught for Anne Nealon's murder in 1956, so poor Anne's family had to go all this time, knowing how terrible their daughter's death was, but also not knowing who was responsible for it, due to the fact that Peter Manuel's father had given him an alibi. Now, again, this was January 1956. Another trigger warning here, we're about to go into the second set of victims, which took place in September 1956. The 17th of September 1956 in Five Fens Bank Avenue, three women were found murdered. Now that was Marion Watt, 42, Vivian Watt, 16 and Margaret Brown, 41. I'm just double checking we're getting their names correct. Now they were a family and that was a mother and a daughter and a grandmother. They also had the man of the house, William Watt, who was Marion's husband and he had been away to Arisag the night that it had happened. So again, he wasn't in the house when this had happened. He was the main and the prime suspect at that point. Now in the morning of the 17th of September, Helen Collinson, the Watts help, family help that would come in and tidy their house and things, um, went to the house and the curtains were drawn and there was a glass panel smashed. Now it was said that she called the police but it was also later said that she did enter the property and Vivian Watt was still alive at this point but she actually passed away sadly just before the emergency services got there. Now, the police did suspect that William Watt had done the 90-mile round trip through the night to murder his family. As I said, he was in Arisag, so automatically he became the prime suspect and was taken to Berlin. Now, again, at that point, Peter Manuel was not under question. There was no talks around Peter Manuel, but because William Watt was known for having affairs, not being as committed to his family as what he should be. I think he had a little bit of a name about himself that then this is where the gossip mongering started and the jungle drum started going. There had been two eyewitnesses that had said they had seen William Watt. One was a Renfrewshire ferryman who said that he seen him in the car but he was very confused what car it was so the police couldn't use it and then someone from Loch Lomond said they had seen him too. So again it was two separate locations where nothing was really matching up around that. Now, funnily, when William Watt had ended up in Berlin, so did Peter Manuel at the same time. And apparently, Peter Manuel had been taunting William Watt, I know who killed your family, I will tell you who killed your family. So this went on to the point that then William Watt's lawyer, Peter Manuel, wrote a letter asking if he would be able to represent them. It's a bit strange that he's contacting William Watt's lawyer and William Watt is allowing this in some way or maybe he wasn't accepting of it, but it's a bit strange they've both ended up in the same place and they're having conversations about who killed his family. So now William Watt was clear. Peter Manuel was still proclaiming innocence, but the bottom line was Marion Watt, 42, was shot dead in her bed. Her sister, which I do apologise, I'd said grandmother at the start, her sister Marion Brown, 41, was shot dead and Vivian at 16 was shot dead and as I said already it was reported that she was actually alive until the, just before the emergency services got there and yet again these were unsolved murders. I find it very strange that William Watt was quite in more toe with Peter Manuel and I feel the solicitor could have something to do with that too. When I was researching the case and I got to this part, I kept thinking that just there's something not right here. I was more inclined to go around William Watt than to go to Peter Manuel. Also, the difference between Peter Manuel's killings, um, what he could get from it. Whether, I don't think William Watt put the gun to his family's head. I do think that is Peter Manuel, but I do feel William Watt could have had something to do with asking Peter Manuel to do it. As I said already, Peter Manuel's the type that went in and out of the pub, so was William Watt, and there was a time that they'd sat in the pub together. So I just think having connections like that, there's something to be said for that. And why would you speak to someone in prison? When, and I just think, why would you speak to someone in prison that could be responsible for your full family's murder? There's just far too many connections, but you can understand back then the police couldn't put it together together the way we can now when we're looking back on it and we're looking at the case, there's so many similarities. But also, William Watt was very well known for womanising, having a lot of affairs. 
So there could have been a lot of different reasons to why he would want to get rid of his family as well. Again, monetary times. I can't wait to do the spirit box at this side to see what comes out around that. So don't worry, it is one of the questions. And please pop comments below for when we get to the spirit box, what questions you want to ask. Now, Peter Manuel's next victim was Isabel Cook. She was 17. She lived in Five Carrot Drive in Mount Vernon. She attended Hamilton Academy. She lived with her parents and her three brothers and her grandmother. She was 17 years of age. But what we need to remember is as well, from the Watt family murder, Peter Manuel had a lot of drama to deal with. So is that why it took him so long to kill again within that time? Bearing in mind we were in a reign of two-year terror at this point. The people of Uddingston didn't know who was doing it. But also Mount Vernon is not that far from Uddingston. So he very much stayed in his own stretch in homeland when he was doing these murders or picking his victims. Now, Isabel was attending the Uddingston Masonic Hall that evening to meet her boyfriend, Douglas Bryden, who was 16. She was leaving the house at quarter to seven to catch the bus at half past seven, but her dad said she was in a bit of a rush and he is inclined to believe that she went a quick way to make the bus on time, which would have been out the back of her cul-de-sac in which it went to the railway, down to Mount Vernon Avenue and then to Hamilton Road. Now, the shortcut included a pathway in which Peter Manuel had attacked a woman and her 11 year old in 1946 so again Peter Manuel was very very aware of this area he knew the area very well considering he'd attacked before there Isabel was wearing a blue raincoat a blue and white dress a headscarf with a France map on the back of it as well as Eiffel Tower earrings nylon stockings she had a vanity case with shoes and money in it and that was the belongings she had taken that night with her Isabel's mum and dad got home about 8pm that evening. As the night was going on, they did find it strange that she wasn't home yet. Now, they both went to bed around midnight and her dad couldn't sleep. So he got back up and went out with a torch and searched for her. He did go down the pathway that she had been attacked on and her body was actually a quarter of a mile away, but he didn't know at that time. The very next morning, the family decided that they were going to have to alert the police that she was missing. They called the police at 4.30 that day and eventually that day the police found Isabel's purse at Barachne Bridge. They also then started to find the rest of her belongings, her underskirt, her coat, her vanity case. Now the strange part was all her belongings was in a straight line from her house to Peter Manuel's house. So Manuel was taunting the police, he had wrote letters to them, he had no respect for the police, he had no remorse for his crimes whatsoever and I think he was trying to get more to the police than he was to his victims. So from the 28th of December until the 6th of January, the case was pretty hot and then eventually it was taken straight off the papers and the front page and the reason for that was because another family in Uddingston had been murdered. So at this point, Anne's body had not been discovered. All her belongings had been discovered, but they just could not find her body. As I said, coming on to the next set of victims is the smart victims. Now, just to make you aware, I have been out to location with this. I was thinking about taking you guys in to show you the location, but I think for the respect to the people who now live there and within that area, it would be very, very unfair. But I had a very, very good psychic connection around the Uddingston area to do with the Smart family. I think it's a very, very sad case. And it's one of the first locations through the crime stories that I actually did visit in lockdown. And it's one of the other reasons it spurred me to do this case. So just before we come on to the Smart family, I did go out to location with the Smart family. I've been in the street. I've had a little nosy about. It's a very quiet street and I do very much feel... It was such a random attack and I can actually understand why it went unnoticed for as long as what it did. But what I will say around Peter Manuel is he didn't go far. He literally went in a circle around his murders. If you know the area well, Mount Vernon, where the Smarts live, it's just before the Blantyre Farm Road, just off to the left kind of, so you're still at Uddingston as such. But he knew this area by the back of his hand and I truly believe there's probably more. I do feel there is a very strong connection with Peter Manuel and the Blantyre Farm Road and just that whole stretch altogether. And again, if you know the area, you'll probably understand why I'm saying that. We are now going on to the Smart family. Another trigger warning here. A very, very sad part of the case. But again, get the kettle on, get your biscuits on and let's do it. Peter Smart was a 45-year-old man who lived alongside his wife Doris and their 11-year-old son Michael and they lived in Sheepburn Avenue in Uddingston. Now... 
Peter worked for JR building contracts in Old London Road. And over the Christmas period, you're obviously off for two weeks. He was not due back to the 6th of January. So they had planned to go and visit Peter's parents in Jedburgh, as well as visiting their friends in Dumbarton at the Dumbreck Hotel over Christmas and New Year. On New Year's Eve, Peter decided he was going to get some drink in for his friends and family who were coming for the bells. In Scotland, hug money is a very, very big thing. And even back then, it was such a bigger thing. First foot, your neighbours, your friends would be in your house and parties would be going on to three and four and five in the morning. The Smart family had arranged the exact same type of party. Peter had went to the pub at closing time at 10 o'clock. He left with his bottles of whiskey, went home and him and Doris entertained family and friends and neighbours until 2.30 in the morning and that is when they went to sleep. Now bearing in mind it's likely they told their friends and family they were going to be going visiting the very next day whether it be the whether they'd be visiting the parents or the friends at the Dumbreck Hotel. They were still very unsure and they had told their family and friends that. Sadly a few hours later the Smart family were murdered in their beds one by one and they lay undiscovered for six days. Now, on the 1st of January, the Smart family's curtains were all closed but the neighbours were not concerned because, again, they'd said that it's likely they were going away. But a dustman did report on the 3rd of January that the curtains were open. And also on the 3rd of January, one of Michael's friends went to his home and chapped the door, nobody answered, but all the curtains were closed again at that point. And later that day, a close friend had noticed that the curtains had been opened, then closed again, and the window had been opened. Now, they did say that the smarts were very house proud, so she found that very strange, that the curtains were like that and the windows were left open. But also, her husband later that night had seen a light on, so they just presumed that the smart family were already back home, or they had never went in the first place. Now, on the 4th of January, a neighbour, Mr Jackman, had also noticed that the curtains were open again, but they were open unevenly, and it was said Doris would never have tolerated anything like that, so again, they were finding that strange, but also, the postman had tried to deliver a parcel and couldn't, and passed it to Mr Jackman, the neighbour, and said, I think they're all dead in there, because the curtains were shut, but obviously jokingly. It was only noticed on the 6th of January when Peter didn't turn up to his work that the alarm was raised. Now, it was two office workers and a police constable who went out to the house. They then discovered the bodies. They realised that they'd all been shot in the head in their beds. But also, the curtains had been open and shut. So again, straight away, they knew something wasn't right because people were talking and saying, this isn't right. So the police then searched around the surrounding areas for the weapon. Now, the weapon was an Italian-style automatic Beretto, Beretto pistol. At this point, the search was still ongoing for Isabel Cook as well, so the police had a lot in their hands. On New Year's Eve, uh, Lady Mary MacDonald, who was a student nurse at the Southern General, had reported she'd received a call from Teresa Manuel, which was Peter Manuel's sister. And Peter Manuel was in the background singing and very in good spirits. She found it all very strange. And looking back, it looks like he was trying to create some sort of alibi. But it was also said at that time he was splashing the cash, he was gifting his friends, he was at the pub, he was giving drinks out galore. And in reality, he was always known for never having any money. But obviously it was the smart money. He was also going back and opening their windows, eating their food and also gloating over the bodies. It's absolutely sick. Peter Manuel ended up confessing, obviously because his dad had been charged. Now, a trigger warning for the next few parts because I'm going to read out Manuel's take on how he killed the Smarts and what he did exactly. Peter Manuel's account of the Smart murder. Trigger warning, guys. I did it about 6am on New Year's Day. I got in the kitchen window and went into a bedroom and got 18 to £20 pounds in new notes and four or five ten shillings notes in a wallet. It was in a jacket hanging on a chair in the man's room. I shot the man first and then the woman and then shot the the boy. I then went into the living room and I ate a handful of wee biscuits from a tray and I got about 18 shillings from a red purse in the woman's handbag. I took the man's keys and then took the car. I threw the gun in the Clyde and the keys in the, in the calder. Peter Manuel confessed to all his crimes and 19 days after Isabel Cook went missing, her body was found. Now, on the 11th of July, 1958, Manuel was hanged in the gallows of Berlin Prison by Harry Allen. His last words are reported to have been, turn up the radio, radio and I'll go quietly. 
it baffles me, absolutely baffles me. Now, what we're going to do is come on to exactly what I get psychically from this. I think these have got a fair idea. And then we're going to do the spirit box. It goes without saying Peter Manuel was rotten to the core. But I actually feel that this whole case is based around cat and mouse between Peter Manuel and the police. I want to say that there's a lot more unsolved murders that connect to Peter Manuel. I am convinced Blantyre Farm Road has something to do with it as well. Again, we know he's not Bible John, but I can understand why loads of people would expect him. I actually think he's a lot more brutal than Bible John. I feel Bible John was somebody, we'll go into that in a different case, I'll not even get into it, but I don't think he was the same type of character as Peter Manuel. Peter Manuel was very clever, very calculated. Um, I do get the number 14 with something regarding Peter Manuel. I feel that's 14 victims. I truly, truly believe my work where the number 14 all the way through this case has came and he is laughing, knowing that these cases are unsolved. He doesn't want to be connected to them. The cases that he confessed to are the ones that the police asked him of. If they had asked him about other ones, he would have said yes or no, but he wasn't asked. That's what I'm getting anyway. Um, it will never connect anything to him in the future, I don't think, because I think it's too far gone. But I do feel this was down to spoiled brat syndrome. I wonder if his family tried to overcompensate from moving back and trying to settle him back in, taking the blame for the bullying. I don't think he was bullied. I think he was a bully and people stood up to him. But I do think in later life, anger took over, psychopath, a lot of mental health, things that we never spoke about spoke about back then that we speak about now. No excuse for his behaviour whatsoever. I think he deserves everything he, sh he gets. I think his father should have had more repercussions. I also think the lawyer around the Watts, which I'm coming on in a second, is very suspicious around it all as well. I think I smell crap with that one. <laughs> I think William Watt asked Peter Manuel to murder his family and I think that it backfired because he didn't think he was going to be the prime suspect because he was an Arasag, which I do think he was, but I do think a female was with him there. Um, but what I do think is it backfired and when Peter Manuel was put in jail, I think it was for like um, house breaking, where their paths have crossed, they've came to a deal and that's why the solicitor and the lawyers got involved. I think everything's very corrupt. The police, the lawyers, the solicitors around this case and I feel like that's what tainted the case for a long time. When you're actually Googling the case, one of the questions that always come up is who was the detective on the case? People were looking for recognition. That's all it was about for them. Whether in reality, a lot of these victims probably became victims because they never did the right thing with Peter Manuel to begin with. He gave a police officer a lift. Surely they should have been more wiser to that type of person. He was known to the police from 16 and he was away for nine years. Uddingston, Birkinshaw isn't that big a place. People speak, especially around the police. So I think between the police and the politics around that case, very, very corrupt. Right, let's come on to the spirit box. Let's see what it says. I I do, again, I'm going to ask about William Watt, but comment below if there's any questions that you think we should have, if there is any questions that I don't ask that you think I should have asked, but I am going to ask about the William Watt case in particular, what the driver behind it was, is there any more victims, where are they, give us locations, please, please, the spirit box can be very hard to hear, but just write down in the comments what you hear, it could be one word, because what you'll realise is with the comments, it actually builds a picture, and it helps me as well, so thank you so much, remember, like, comment, subscribe, right, get the lights out for this, get some sage on, let's do the spirit box, let's contact Peter Manuel and get to the bottom of this, let's do the spirit box. Spirit, if you're with us, give me a sign that you're here. Peter Manuel, if you're with us, speak through the spirit box. Tell me what you want to tell us. Is there anything that we need to know? Peter Manuel, were you asked to kill the Watt family? <laughs> Who made you do it? <laughs> Did William Watt pay you to do it? Oh, I'm sorry. 
Did you return to the murder scene of Anne Newlands afterwards? Another one, another one. Who is the other one? Isabel Cook. Did you revisit the site of Isabel Cook after killing the Smart family? <laughs> what made you kill the Smart family? Was it random or did you know them? Did you go back to the smart house and feed the cat and open the windows? Does your dad know about other murders that we don't know about? A spade. Somebody gave him a spade. Last question, have you killed any more and do you have names or locations? Burns or is the Burns a connection to your street name? Something. Is there any other names or locations of any unsolved murders that you can see you did? you again for watching if you've stayed this long please again comment below in the spirit box as i said it gives you a little bit of a sore head just so you know it is actually 20 to 2 in the morning i'm just finishing this video i was dreading doing the spirit box at this time yeah very very angry spirit i do feel he is a serial killer as we know anyway but i think there'll be a lot of unsolved murders in scotland but blantyre farm roads and those surrounding areas i feel very strong rounds about 
guys thank you so much for watching i hope you enjoy the rest of your day remember like comment subscribe and i will put my link to you at the bottom of the comments for the rest of your socials stay safe stay safe take care Thank you.